Yeah, I forgot. To, out of practice. I didn't even put this on yet. <laughs> but I think I'd better. There. All right, well, we, <laughs> we have fumbled through it, praise the Lord. <laughs> you know, a battery, the funniest little things. <laughs> I was wondering why I didn't hear it still. <laughs> so I was just like, I'm just going to keep playing. It's good. All right, so we're in Acts 28. Acts 28, and right before I went on vacation, I shared on this, and I have more to say, always, always have more to say, but more to say on this, but we'll hit the whole chapter, but first, just a couple of quick anecdotes from our vacation, uh, mostly the trip back, which started miserably, um, so I've never done this before, and I've shared this with a few of you, so you already know, sorry, you'll have to suffer through it again, but our wheelchair ramp has these two parts that go up, you know, like a tent like this. And there's a bicycle gear right here and a chain, a bicycle chain that kind of releases it and then opens it and the whole thing's on hydraulics, comes down. And so that's how we easily get Adea, my daughter, in a wheelchair with cerebral palsy in and out of the wheelchair. So I've packed up everything. It's early in the morning. We just want to get driving because it's a 28-hour drive with the little ones from St. Pete. And so I want to get going early. So I get her all in. Everything's, I'm already not in a good mood. I'm not going to lie. Might as well just full disclosure. I'm not happy about it. My, not, it's not just a, the ending of a vacation. It's I've been holding a four-month-old and a one-month-old of two different of my grandkids, two different families, and then playing with all my grandkids at parks and stuff. And just every day is that magical moment of just being with them. And, you know, you, you watch time elapse and you see them do things like walk when you're not there or talk when you're not there. You so know, when I, so many do. And, and you're not close enough. So those, those times are so vital. And so when you're there, you make the most of every moment. You stand up till midnight, kids asleep on every couch and chair and lap. You know, I don't, I don't, wherever they want to sleep is fine. No one's going home because we're trying to make the most of every second. And so I, I'm overtired. And I'm aggravated that I'm leaving. And my time just went like, you know, like it always does. And I push a day in and I push the button for the wheelchair ramp. It's never done this before. It grabbed my shoelace. So that gear grabbed my shoelace. I'm no, 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 no. And it goes about that high. I don't. Uh, my foot, you know, it's not like I was like all limbered up and stretched out for this maneuver that just happened. So it just keeps dragging my foot. I was like, no, stop, stop, stop. And there's no, you can't talk to a gear. It just does what it does. And it pulls my shoe all the way up to here, wrenches my hip and my back, which is quite sore, by the way. I'm, I'm excedrin right now. That's why I'm able to stand here before you. And I was, so now I got 28 hours to drive with my, like, like this, you know, and I thought, okay, that's just awesome this started like that, but we spent $1,200 right before we left because our airbag light went off. We're trying to get a sticker for the van, and we can't get it, and then you can't get into a place uh, to get it done because you have to go back to the dealership to get that one done, and so they, they're like two months out for everybody, so we're way overdue on our sticker, and we just like, just, we just want to get, so like, oh, just, just, I'm thinking it's just going to be click, and it's done. You know, they reset it. No, it's $1,200, $1,300 later, and then it's fixed, and God's been so gracious in meeting all these things because my other car had something else happened. I was like, why is this right before our vacation? You know, well, there goes all that money. And we're watching it, but, but God was so gracious. And there are people here that did really kind things because you heard about it, and thank you. But we're driving back, and the airbag light comes back on. <laughs> I mean, we're, we're, we're not, I don't even know if we're out of Florida before that thing comes back on. I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> then the engine lights flash in, the, <laughs> the, the tire flash. I mean, it's like, it's like a switchboard. I'm like, you know, Satan, you're really getting on my nerves this morning in particular. And I'm listening to, as this is all happening, a message that Brian um, shared here when I was gone. I did a tremendous job. 
and he was sharing on journaling and why that's vital and why you do it. And so like when the next troubled time comes up, you remember the last dilemma that he delivered you from and you now read about it and you're like juiced up with that and you're like, well, then I know you're going to show up again. And then you trust in that, you know? And, and so that, that was how I was so, and they said, you should be thanking God. So I'm, I, I'm then, <laughs> one of my own commercials comes on about thanking God for Thanksgiving on, on Reach FM. And I'm, I'm hearing that. I was like, thank for this, thank for that, thank for this, and, and get geared up. I was like, I'm not super thankful right now. But I practiced it. We, we both did. My wife and I, we just started just anything we could think of, just start thanking him for. This van We've never even made one payment on. It's a $60,000 wheelchair van, and God provided that money off a random phone call from death benefits from a day as mom that died on the table that was accruing over eight years, and we didn't even know it. Uh, and the government calls us, so we've been looking for you, and gives us enough money to buy this wheelchair van at the time we needed it. So God, and that was just, you know, we put half of it down, and then she, but you're going to get a certain amount every month, and it pays the monthly payment for this thing. So we've never put a cent into it, and God's been so gracious, so I got no right to be complaining about some switchboard lights going off and on as we drive home. Never once did it hesitate or have an issue, nothing's wrong, the lights all went out by the time I got home, so I think God was just like, just testing you. <laughs> Will you thank me? when you're leaving and then all this is happening. <laughs> you know, will you do it? We did. We passed that test eventually. Wow. Eventually. We had a lot of time to think about it. Uh, and, you know, you're just driving. So, uh, <laughs> funny things, you know, you're driving around St. Pete, uh, the trop has this dome, it's all ripped off the top, a crane's been blown off the top of a building and destroyed part of downtown St. Pete. 12,500 homes, I think it was, were destroyed in St. Pete alone, where all my kids and parents are, and none of their homes were touched, just cosmetically, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah, it was, we thought we weren't even going to be able to go. I don't know if I shared this or not, but I shared it with someone this morning, but my son has a shed that he put together. And it was a nice metal shed, and the wind, you know, 120 mile per hour sustained winds, it blew that across and blew his, his fence down, so it's just mess of metal and wood. And his wife's filming him as he goes through his Milwaukee tools that were in it, and hoping that they're all surviving. And she zooms in on this little white box that was still in the wrap as he's sorting through stuff, you know, like, oh, okay, that's still good, that's still good, oh yeah. He moves something, there's this white box, it's still in the plastic wrap. And she zooms in on the title and it says, Shed anchors. <laughs> and she goes, she's just talking to the phone. She goes, well, that would have been helpful about three days ago. You know, when you put it together, you know, you, you try to cut some corners, you know. Uh, so, you know, we're just, we're, we're just uh, there's all these funny things happening at once. Uh, even as I'm driving home, I'm thinking, in another week, I turn, well, two weeks, I don't know, I'm too old to remember. Uh, I turn 55, and I thought to myself, God, I'm halfway to 60. And I felt like God said to me, your son's halfway to 60. You're halfway to 110. <laughs> I was like, wow, it's not helping right now. But it made me laugh, and we just started thanking God, and then I just, I just arrived at home at this, um, this house that I'm so thankful God gave us, and it's perfect for my little Adea, because the house, you know, any house you go to just isn't for a child that can't move her body correctly. And she was desperate to be on the second floor where we were, so I would carry her up a flight of stairs and around a tight corner every day. We both almost died over and over and over and over and over. But we managed, we made it work, uh, and we just had an amazing time, really. So the Word, this is just uh, awesome. It's so funny. Let's read it. Let's read it, because it's uh, very appropriate. Acts 28. Uh, backdrop, we all know, Paul's boat just got blown to bits on the shore in a hurricane. They're having their own hurricane. 
which they call Northeaster over there. It's broken the entire boat. 276 guys get on pieces of the boat and swim ashore. And, uh, you know, the ones that can swim, swim. The ones that can't grab floating pieces and just float in. Everybody's on the shore dragging themselves up. It's a storm. It's freezing. And, and this is what happens. And God did that. God got them here. Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta, because they don't even know where they are. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire, and they welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for though he just escaped that sea, that storm, the goddess justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said, he must be a god. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, or Publius, I've heard it both ways, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him, and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. And when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came, and they were cured. They honored us in many ways, and when they were ready to sail, when we were ready to sail, that's three months later, they furnished us with the supplies that we needed. Now, just a note, they've gone 14 days not eating food and in constant suspense, being driven way off course by a terrible northeaster storm hurricane that finally they throw their own tackle, their own steering wheel off, their own food off, and just hope for the best with no land in sight. And then when finally they're they're sensing that there's land, because they're doing soundings and they can see, whoa, we're moving very fast towards land, we're going to crash. They get stuck in a sandbar, the waves beat up the boat, destroy it, and they just swim ashore with nothing. Like nothing. They just arrived with just their lives. You have to, a couple things to note about this is, first, with Paul is Aristarchus from Gaius and Luke. You find them throughout the scriptures, and Luke's the one writing the story and telling us what happened. And Luke, the doctor, and Aristarchus, they're the kind of friends you want. Everywhere Paul goes, something hard happens. His ministry constantly brings out vipers. His ministry constantly does that. And, and here he is again. He's coming up. He's gathering wood. And a viper is driven out by the heat. Understand that this is Satan. Don't, don't mistake it. I told you last time we shared on this, there's no poisonous snakes on this island. This thing got here from some other Alexandrian ship. It's not even supposed to be on the island. And of all the people, it's in a stick that Paul picks up, you know, and it's driven out by the heat. Scripture is always telling you things for a reason. When you are purposefully just, just God, whatever you want, Paul goes to Jerusalem. He says, I know that bad things are going to happen to me. I know I might even die, but I'm supposed to go, but I won't die there. Because God told me I'm supposed to go to Rome. So they're going to send me on their own dollar to Rome. I know it's going to happen. Everybody's like, don't go, don't go. We know it's going to happen too. Prophets keep saying bad stuff's going to happen. I get it, I get it. I got to go. God's told me to go, and I'm going. So when you take yourself, and you know there's just severe danger possibly awaiting you, and God's even warned you some of it's going to be pretty bad, and you do it anyway, that's... That's just such a a testing and a beautiful result of faith. And, and and, and, And then to just throw yourself into his will, so much of his journey has been, oh, I should go to, Mas- I should go to uh, Asia. And God says, no, no, I want you in Macedonia. Gives them a vision. So they go. He keeps listening to God and responding, listening to God and responding and going exactly where God would have him go. I want you to go to Corinth now. I want you to go to Ephesus now. And he goes where God wants. He prays, he listens, and then he makes a decision. 
But starting with this decision to go to Jerusalem, none of the places he goes next will be his choice. They will all be chosen by the world. Every single one of them. Once he hits Jerusalem, all the choices aren't his anymore. He even warns them in Cyprus on the boat, if you take this boat any further, we're all probably going to die. God's already told me you're going to lose a lot of the ship and the cargo, and you might lose all of our lives. So you, we should wait. They don't listen to him, and they go on, and of course it almost happens. And then God graciously grants them all their lives, but he does blow the rest of it into the water because they didn't listen. But he doesn't get to make any choices. He's put in jail by the Romans for two years under Felix and Festus. Then he's sent to Rome. They don't make it. They're supposed to stop at Cyprus and then make it towards Italy. And they're blown so far off course, they don't even know where they are. 14 days, days by a storm, boats destroyed, and they drag themselves on shore. If I was Paul, I would hope this was my opportunity to maybe get away. You know, especially when he wins the whole island by healing the main guy his dad, and then all the people from the island go, well, we got sick people too. Can you heal them? And he prays over them, and they all get healed. They must just think, this guy is amazing. Nobody wants him to go. You would think that maybe this would be an opportunity for you. I just, I want you to see something that's going on. He has thrown himself so deeply into God's will that now he doesn't get to even choose anymore. It's all being chosen for him, and you would think by the Romans, but it's not. It's by God who's using the Romans to get his will done, just like he did with Christ. So he lands on Malta. And as reading it, you're like, oh, wow, crash landed, castaways, stuck on this island where they don't know where they are, bit by a viper instantly. Know that first. Every time that you're doing exactly what God would have you do, the heat of the Holy Spirit that's in you and on you will drive out vipers. And when it does, they'll try to fasten themselves to you. When it drives them out, they will try to strike you. When he casts a demon out of a girl in Philippi, all hell literally breaks loose. And he's beat up and put in jail and God frees him from that mess. Every time you see Paul moving place to place preaching the gospel, vipers come out and they fasten themselves to him. And it doesn't seem very fair. It feels like, man, he's doing what he's supposed to do. Why is he suffering like this? Well, right from the beginning he knew that. But you know what? His whole life was suffering before this. He was just a miserable wretch of a man. And he's so thankful that Christ saved him and gave him eternity in heaven, but also gave him such peace on earth that he's just like, I will do whatever you want, wherever it takes me. So he does. And it lands him on, Al on Malta as a castaway. But thrown entirely into the very will of God, isn't that a place that frightens most of us? Isn't that a place that's scary? To be thrown directly into the will of God and you have no choice? Now it's zero. You have no choice. You've made some choices to follow him, but now the boat's moving and you can't stop it. It reminds me of this stupid ride at Bush Gardens that I would get on to just to prove I was brave enough. And I hated it. I hated it, but my kids would mock me until I rode the stupid thing because I have a fear of heights. And it was a Sheikra, and it would take you 220 feet up and then just let you just, it would hold you there while people are counting. I'm just like, stop, stop, be quiet. I'm trying to concentrate on how I'm going to die. And it's just a 220-foot straight drop into a giant 180-foot loop. You're like, why do I do this? Why do I do this? So you're, you're just going chink, 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 and you're just like, I can't move the thing. Like, you just want to get off. It's too late now. You chose. You chose. Now you're under someone else's will, not your own. Well, getting on that boat probably felt like this to Luke and Aristarchus. I want out. I want out. I didn't know the boat was going to just be destroyed. I didn't know about the storm. I didn't know about the 14, 14 days without food. But they don't. They hang right with him. They had to. Luke was going to tell all the future generations about this, so it was vital that he was there. So it seems like this big mess. But each time that the viper comes out and strikes and, and Paul puts his attention on Christ only and only the will of God, 
He comes out of it and wins souls in the process. Every time. Every single time. He goes through these things, but then people watching him go through them are so affected by him that when God comes to the rescue, they're like, I need to know the God that you know. You're going to go through things, people. We're going to go through things. They're meant, they're meant to show the world that God is God. That's why the scripture says, when we're weak, he's strong. Our failures, our broken places, the places where we get crushed, the places where we got nothing else to do but just call on his name and beg for mercy, and then it somehow works? That is, you just give all the glory to him. It's one of the few times we do. All the other times we kind of take some of it. Well, I, I, I actually made some pretty good choices. No, you, <laughs> you just got saved by God. <laughs> you know, but so often we, we just want a little bit of the glory, you know. Uh, and we'll say a little bit of this, that, how we kind of made the victory happen. But it was, it was totally God. But boy, you should have seen how I, you know, you know and we, we, we can do that. <laughs> it's always him. It's always him, but there are those few moments where all you can do is just breathe out, even gasp out the name of Jesus. Sometimes it's because you're about to hit another car. And there's a one word you could say, Jesus! <laughs> just, just, and you're calling out, just please! That's all you can come up with. And he saves you. And you give him total credit. And when, we, and when we were in those places like, a, like the boats just blasting apart and you're going to jump into churning waters and crawl on shore, everyone's just giving credit to Jesus. When you get bit by a poisonous viper and people are expecting you to swell up or die and you, nothing even happens, you give credit to Jesus. You don't go, wow, what, what an amazing immune system I have. I have such an incredible immune system that didn't even bother me. Take another bite, little snake. You know, that, that we give him total credit when we're stuck like this, but I want you to see something. Okay, listen, listen, listen to what Paul says. This is Paul writing, and it's very important to understand that. He's writing in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 onward, and he says this. And I didn't put this on the board, so you don't, just listen. He's talking about comparing himself to other people, and he's, and he's only doing it to make a point. And if you read the rest of this section, you'll hear it. But he says, are these other guys servants of Christ? I'm out of my mind to talk like this. I'm more of a servant. I've worked harder. I've been in prison more frequently. I've been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three, he, that time killed him, by the way, and God brought him back. Three times I was shipwrecked, this being one of them. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. Actually, no, when he wrote Corinthians, no. This is number four. <laughs> this is Port Chipwreck. So anyway, uh, he, didn't, he didn't have this information at the time. Uh, I spent a night and a day in the open sea another time. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews always, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers, like his own thought they were brothers turning on him. I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. And if you read through Acts, there's stuff here he didn't even mention. And then he hits Malta, completely throws himself into God's will. Whatever happens, happens. Whatever happens, happens, God. It's a pretty rough start. But Malta is a resort. Malta is a resort island today. January's 65 degrees, 10 hours of sunlight. They're going to winter in Malta. 
When he arrives, the islanders are super nice. They make a fire. They, they, they give him food. The main official lets him stay at his house even though he's a prisoner. They're treated so good and the people love him. You, see, you healed so many people. Here, what, what do you need? We'll get you on a boat. Here's an Alexandrian boat. We'll put you on it. What supplies do you need? We'll give you everything you need. They're there for three months through the worst time in most places. It's a resort on Malta. It's a lovely place to visit. And he gets to stay there with no one attacking him, no one being violent, no one talking about him mean. They're all coming to him. And you would think, wow, what a gift to Paul. And it is. Man, that guy needs a vacation. I thought I needed a vacation. He needs a vacation. The guy, do you hear that list? That was nothing. That was a smattering. He gets this three-month vacation. He's just come out of two, two years in a Roman jail. He, he, he gets a vacation with everyone adoring him. Isn't that pretty cool? He threw himself into God's will, started a little rocky, and then God said, you need this. You too, Luke and Aristarchus. It's not easy for any of you here. He does that with us. But you know what's more beautiful? He gets out, and they go, oh, wow. The goddess of justice wouldn't let him live. He got bit by a snake. Oh, nothing happened. Oh, wow, he's a god. They don't know the last thing about who God is. There's only one God. There's, there's God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. That's all there is. And they're talking about this goddess justice, and well, Paul himself, might, he must be a god. Look at him. They know nothing. There's all kinds of sick people on the island. That are going to die without help. God took that ship going to Rome and went, Berk, and blew it over here to Malta to save countless souls. If Paul didn't arrive, they all stay lost. They needed Paul. And God knew they needed the message that he had put in Paul. And so... He throws himself into God's will. All this happenstance of a hurricane and throwing everything overboard and barely making it ashore, it was all from him to save the people of Malta. So now let's read, just read a little further because you want to show you what's, what's going on. It's, it's wild. The, all the world... You know, the Romans, the sailors, they're trying to go a different way, and God pushes everything in the direction that he wants it to go to honor both Paul and this kind-hearted, lost people. They're not even a nasty people. They don't do anything mean to the people that drag up on their shore. They're trying to, to help them in everything they can do. Paul says to the people on Crete, Cretans, are, they're always brutal. They're lazy gluttons. Puts it in the word of God. <laughs> you know, it's like, ouch. <laughs> you know, uh, that's a rough thing to say about that island. But about this island, the word says they were unusually kind, but lost. Do you know people like that? So do I. I know people who put me to shame in doing Christian-like things. And they don't know the Lord. I'm like, how do you even get where you are? How do you put up with what you put up with? How, how do you treat people the way you do and you don't even know who Jesus is? Like, I do it because Christ is in me and he's made me a new creation. It's, it's changed my behavior. You do it just because you're who you are. There's a whole bunch of kind people on this island that were dying in two ways. He sent Paul to save him, and I think that's awesome. We have no idea the dramatic and frustrating things that happen in our lives, how they're going to affect unbelievers all around us and possibly save their souls. You're not going through anything by chance. And God knows when to give a vacation. 
All right, so reading a little bit further into the chapter, it reads like this, uh, verse 11. After three months, three months on the resort island of Malta, beautiful temperatures, lots of sunshine, it must have been hard to leave. It was for me. <laughs> you know, it must be hard to leave. I left here in a t-shirt, came back freezing. Found, you know, we had this little fountain out back and it's ice. I was like, what? <laughs> 28 degrees when I drove my daughter to school the next day. I'm like, what happened to this place? It wasn't like this two weeks ago when I left. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship that had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship from Egypt, with the figurehead of the twin gods Castor and Pollux, more lost people. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there for three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day we, uh, the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Puccioli. And there we found some brothers and sisters who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. The brothers and sisters there heard that we were coming and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. That means nothing to us? Unless you're really up on Roman history and geography and you know where the three taverns is? I don't. But I did look up the distance and it's large. These people that went this long, usually people would only go this far if a king was coming or a very recognized figure that everybody wanted to see and get an autograph. The people that are the brothers and sisters in this area have come to see this guy who the whole world's talking about because of the guy that died for the whole world that's in him. And they're inviting him to stay in their houses. Can you stay with me? Stay with me? Again, he's being treated like royalty. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God. And he was encouraged. And when we got to Rome, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. And when they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers... Although I've done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and I was handed over to the Romans. They examined me and they wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I certainly didn't intend to bring any charge against my own people. Wow, even while they're trying to get him killed, he's preserving their lives. Him, a Roman citizen. For this reason, I've asked to see you and talk with you. It's because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. They replied, We've not received any letters from Judea concerning you, and none of our people who've come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. Like, I'm not sure if what you're saying is accurate scripturally, so we need to hear what you've got to say. We haven't heard about you, but we heard about people like you following this Jesus. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God. And from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. I love that, by the way. Everything that we see going on in the New Testament, Jesus, 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 we're reading about it in the New Testament. So we use those tools to share with other people who Jesus is, the New Testament. He doesn't have the New Testament. He's with one of the guys that's currently writing it. He is one of the guys that's currently writing it. And so they don't have that tool. So what he's using is all of the Old Testament to show everybody who Jesus is. You're like, well, wait, didn't Jesus come like in the New Testament? No, Jesus has always been, and he's all through the Old Testament. You never won't find Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. It's all about him. You'll never not find him. He's all through the Word. You know, people feel like, well, if I read too much of the Old Testament, I feel like i got to get back to the New Testament because that's where Jesus is. Wrong. Look for him in the Old Testament, and it'll be just as vital and alive to you as the New Testament. You just got to find Jesus there, and he's all through it. Come on a Wednesday night. I'll show you. 
Wednesday nights, we go over the Old Testament, going through Exodus, chapter by chapter by chapter, just like we're going through Acts chapter by chapter, just going through the Word. Jesus is in every word. You won't ever not find him. Yeah. Some, verse 24, were convinced by what he said. So you saved some of your own people. But others would not believe. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul made this final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through Isaiah the prophet 800 years ago, at their time, go to this people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They've closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I'd heal them. It's Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 that he's quoting. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Well, every time he does that, that's like taking a grenade and going, <laughs> he just blew the whole thing up. Now he's going to be screaming, yelling, oh, the Gentiles, we hate them. Uh, some manuscripts have a verse here, 28, 29, that says, um, after he said this, the Jews left, arguing vigorously among themselves. Because even a lot of the believing Jews hated it that the Gentiles were getting in so easy. But listen how this finishes. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house. And he welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Two more years. I, I had a title up, I don't, know if I, I don't know if it was up in the beginning, but it was just A Rented Home in Rome. He's not in jail, people. He gets to Rome and he sits in a rented house. How is he paying for a rented house? I don't know if the believers are, if he's on the government's dime, but he's in a house, a rented house. He's still chained. But you know what's crazy? He's free. He's chained to Jesus Christ. He's chained by grace. He's been changed by grace, and now he's chained to it. He's going to finish his days like that. Chained to grace. People keep coming. He keeps sharing. People keep coming. He keeps sharing the word. He's revered. People are coming to see him, not, to, not without hindrance. No one's, there's no attacks. This is Jesus' retirement plan for Paul. It's like, okay, man, he's still working. But what a deal at the end. And shortly after this, history says they beheaded him. Which means he hit the ultimate retirement plan and finally just didn't have to deal with this stuff anymore. <laughs> he had done everything that Christ called him to do. But the freedom that he was chained to the way that Christ had saved his heart, the way that Christ had saved his soul, the way that Christ had taken all that anger out of him and taken all that world out of him. He would put up with anything that God put in front of him to keep having that freedom. I read something online. I was sharing this at the home fellowship that I have last night because it so stuck me. And it was kind of, it's a bit of a stinger, so Prepare. And, uh, you know, you, you, those little quips will come online, a spiritual saying or something. And this said, um, if you're not hungry for God, it's probably because you're too full of yourself. And I was like, oh, that, that's a stinger. And, you know, when someone says, oh, you're just full of yourself, it's, it, it, okay, y'all, you don't want to hear that. <laughs> you know, no one wants to hear that from someone. But if you just take that to the root of what it's saying, you've got too much of you going on. 
and not enough of him, and that's why you're not hungry for him. You're hungry for things that your flesh wants. You're hungry for things that you desire in the moment, but you're not hungry for him. Here's a litmus test. How often do you open the Bible in the week that you're not here? If you don't, you're too full of yourself. I don't know how else to say it. You're not interested. You're interested enough, but we don't get to put God in this convenient little compartment and just pull him out on Christmas and Easter or pull him out on Sunday and then put him back, jam him back in the box until we get together again amongst a bunch of other people who want to and it's super safe. We have got to be fellowshipping. We have got to be fellowshipping. It lights you up. Greg Laurie said, and probably people here have heard it, he said, you, you know, you take one little coal and you put it over here and instantly it goes black from red. But you keep it with all the other coals and it stays hot for a long time. You take one little Christian out of church and put him over here for a while around, among no, no other believers or even a bunch of believers, but no one's pursuing God. No one's stopping what they're doing to look into him, to talk about the word. You start cooling off. That red ember starts to just die. You're still a believer. You're still saved, but you don't have that activity in your life. You don't have a hunger I saw another guy preaching. I can't remember how I saw it. And he was saying that, you know, we so often were just begging God, would you take this out of my life? Take this out of my life. This hurts so bad. I'm so tired of this. He said, God put that in your life so that you'd get on your knees. God put it there so you'd stay focused. God put it there. Stop asking him to take it out and ask him, what does he want you to do? Stop asking him to just remove stuff. What does he want you to do in the middle of what you're dealing with? Because what he will do is crash land you on Malta where there's freedom because his will for you is joy. His will for you is hope. His will for you is peace. His will for you is not to tear your life up and make it frustrating and aggravating. His will for you is to elevate you. But we got to be hungry. There should be some hunger in us. We really got to be careful not to get into a place where we're suffering from spiritual anorexia. We just don't want to eat. You got to want to eat. Go after it. This word is everything. If we have been given a tool that changes the world, why are we not in it? If we've been given a tool that changes us so we can change the world around us, why are we not in it? we got to be hungry or we're too full of ourselves. You're like, wow, we're, who do you think you are? When I read it, it bugged me, okay. Thought I'd share the wealth. I was like, Whew. I'm going to tell you why it bugged me. It didn't bug me because I looked around and thought, well, these losers aren't doing it. That's not what I, that wasn't not you. But whoever was near me at the time. I really, not what I meant. That's not why it bugged me. I didn't look around and find somebody else to put the blame on. It bugged me because it bugged me. I, you know, in Florida, I mentioned this on Wednesday night. In Florida, two of my children just had a brand new baby. They're not sleeping amazingly well. You know, just because it's a new baby. God gives amazing grace to new parents, but you don't sleep, do you? <laughs> no, you don't. Because babies don't sleep. They take like 15-minute naps all night long. Then wake up and want food and things. So, you know, there's that. There were two hurricanes that destroyed just about everything around St. Pete. So there was that. 
Everybody was, th- everybody was displaced and evacuated. One of my friends died in the first one. I'll be doing that funeral later. I was going to do it this time. I went down. I was planning on doing that. And they couldn't find a venue because all the places that they would normally have it had damage. So they couldn't do the funeral for a guy that died in the hurricane. So I'll be going back down in January to do that funeral. Met with the family. They're believers. But, you know, all my family was displaced. They were evacuated. They went to different places. My daughter-in-law was about to give birth when she was displaced, and they had to select a a shelter near a hospital, just in case. Then they got back home and were out of power, no power for a week. It was 90 degrees out. It's kind of a bummer, especially with brand-new babies. Then we got there. And we were wondering if we could even go, if there'd even be a vacation, if this was even going to happen. Would we have a place to stay? Would we all be staying all together in a shelter? <laughs> <You know? laughs> How was this going to look when we got there, if we could? So everybody was bedraggled by the time I got there. And we were so happy to be there and so happy to see each other. Just making the mom- every moment count, every moment count. And we're just you know, hanging out and having a blast and just talking, playing games, just whatever. I got near the end of the vacation, we were all exhausted, and you, know, you can only take small children five, six days of them sleeping on couches or whatever at midnight because you had, nobody wants to leave. And then they're overtired, and then they're punching each other and hitting each other, and they're, they're upset, and they're aggravated, and now you're aggravated, and you know, different moms of different child, this one hit my child. You're all family, but it's starting to be like a little bit of friction, and everybody's overtired because none of us are sleeping well because, you know... You're on vacation and you're just trying to make the most of everything and there are two new babies. And that's just how it is. And we got to the end of the two weeks and me and all of my children, all Christian families, all worship leaders, didn't even take any time to stop everything and just fellowship. We were just so glad to be together. We took all that time and by the end of it, we all felt it. Because just, we're just scrambling to, to make the most of the time. We want to make the most of the time. We should put Christ right in the middle of it. And, and I know that. And being the father and being a pastor and being the most responsible one, they're all super responsible. But I just mean I'm, I'm halfway to 110. I got, I got a little wisdom under my belt. Should have, should have said, hey, we need to stop everything and just get in the word together and just so we pull out the instruments, let's worship. And that's hard to do. Kids are, you know, kids need stuff and but I was lazy with it. And I get to see those kids and their families personally like three times a year. So you got to make use of those. We all know how to do it. We all love it. And didn't. And I thought, what's the matter with me? I, I should have. And then I'm, I'm, it's 7.30 with my foot hooked up in the thing. And all the lights are going off, and my back's screaming, and I'm like, yeah, I had that coming, God. <laughs> and I felt like the Lord was like, that's not for me. That's not, the reminder was from me. That wasn't from me. We have to fellowship with each other, and you really, if you're part of a family, take the time. Take the time. Teach your kids. It's up to you. It's awesome that we got children's ministry. I won't teach your children enough. We have wonderful people in there. We have gifted people in there. It won't be enough. It's once a week for an hour. Teach your children through your actions, through your behavior. Put the word first. Show them what scripture you're using in the thing that you're battling. Why do you put your faith in that word? Show them Show them that praying means something to you. Not a flippant prayer here and there, right before school or before a meal. Show them that to stop and listen for God matters. Show them you reading the Word. This is an area that, that, that recently I felt like, oh, sorry, God, I, I was lazy with that. But normally it's something that really matters all the time to me. Now, it doesn't matter that, you know, well... My, my daughter said to me, she said, you know, Dad, Dad, growing up, 
any time I would get up early for school or do anything, you'd always be sitting on the couch reading the Word, reading the Word, reading the Word, and, and now I do that. Now I do that. We've got to show them. Show them it matters to you. Sometimes you hear something like this, you're like, oh, I've already blown it. I've already blown it. Oh, well, give up now. No. If you're hearing it today, it's because the Holy Spirit wants you to hear it today, so you apply it today. Every time God's speaking something that lands, it's because it's meant to land right then. Don't think, oh, I've, I've already blown it. God must be disappointed with me. He's not. But he is reminding you. That matters. So I got home. This is the last thing. Final point. And I got home, and um, I was feeling that on the drive home, and I just felt like the Lord was like, pick anything. <laughs> pick something. Go over a scripture with your kids and do what you normally do at night to put them to bed because everyone's just falling asleep wherever they fall asleep because you're hanging out all night long and stuff. And a vacation's a vacation. And you're out of sorts. You're not in your normal routine. But it was, uh, I should have tried harder. And so I got home. The first thing we did, it's like, you, you know, we're not going to go to bed till we, till we pray together and go over Scripture together. So I was like, I, God just, I, I, I thought, well, it's Thanksgiving coming up. Let's be thankful. That's a, that was the commercial that I reminded myself of. So I thought Psalms, and I went to Psalm 16, forgetting what was even there. And this is what it reads. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land... They are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will pour out libations of blood. To, to, I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Meaning I won't do things to worship other gods. Lord, you alone are my portion in my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I'll praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I won't be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad. My tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you won't abandon me to the realm of the dead. Nor will you let your faithful ones see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You'll fill me with joy in your presence. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. It's a pretty awesome scripture. It's Psalm 16. We got home, and we went over this, and, and just but even before hitting that, I walked in the door, and because I was just so thankful to be in the home that God gave us, and that the van did not break down on the way home, <laughs> very thankful, and just really looking forward to seeing my church family and just thankful. We had practiced Thanksgiving to the point where it was welling up inside of me in that part that said, I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Well, my children are part of that family. And so are you. And I'm really, really thrilled. And my wife is too to be back. So I love you all. And I hope you have an amazing day. And we're going to pray out. Lord Jesus, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You take time. I don't even know how you do it. There's nine billion of us. But you take time with all of us. 
and you long for it. Like you don't hesitate to fellowship with us. If we just reach out or call out, you're there. And you answer and you speak and you move. And we can rely on you. And we can throw ourselves into the current of your will because you'll crash land us on Malta. And when the dangers and the vipers come because we're being obedient, you protect us. Even though the bite might happen, if we keep our eyes focused on you, the poison can't sit. It can't take effect. We love you so much and we just want to reiterate. We understand that there are eternal pleasures in your right hand. Paul is experiencing them right now. We will. There are eternal pleasures you've offered to your people. The, the, the trade-off is just, there's no comparison. A, a tiny life here and then an eternal life with you. But you know how to give Malta when we need it. And you know how to challenge us when we need it. And you know how to build your people. I pray, Jesus, in this next season, you call your people out. There are people, all your holy people, your chosen ones, all sitting in these seats that have gifts. So many gifts. And so many are untapped still for what you're really going to do. There are people here that don't even know the gifts that they're sitting on. The things that you're going to call out from them to serve in this capacity, to move in such a way as to just draw the neighbors and the people around to wonder what's going on here. I pray, Jesus, you lift up your people, but I pray we would lift you up as well. And help us to be hungry. I pray no one walks out of here and just leaves their Bible on the shelf until next week. Please let no one in here do that. I pray everyone would take that challenge seriously. Get up and collect some manna in the morning before the day starts. We ask these things in your holiest name and praise you, Jesus. Amen. Romans, straight through the New Testament. That's such a great question because now everybody knows where they can read. <laughs> Amen. Have an awesome day, everyone.